All right, guys, welcome back. This is part two on how to flip your first property. I got you. Now, you know, once I do my scope of work, I got everything in order. I have a timeline of when I want to get the project done. Let's say something pops up that you didn't account for, you know, in that scope of work. Um, how do you manage that with the contractors? And what does that process look like when something comes up new? And let's say it's something huge, you know, how do you pivot and kind of handle that situation? Yeah, definitely when you, when you, it all starts with doing a detailed scope of work and doing a contract with the contractor. Okay. And in your contract, you want to spell out, you know, if anything over a hundred dollars or something major, let me know. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you want to be there to see the problem. So for instance, let's say they're demoing for whatever reason, the old kitchen mm -hmm. and you're changing the kitchen cabinets. Um, a lot of times when you have places of water like kitchens and bathrooms, nine times out of 10, the plywood and the floor joists could be rotten. Mm -hmm. So they're calling you saying, hey, this is rotten. Then you want to look at it, you know, assess it. Um, so you can see for yourself it is really what they're saying it is. Okay. And then get them to give you a price. If they can't give you a, a, a price on it, um, maybe, you know, if the price seems too high, maybe shop around and try to get a couple different bids on it so you understand what that cost is. Gotcha. And even if they give you a price, if you're new, it's not even a bad idea just to get some other prices. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, what I found, you have multiple ways of solving a problem with different solutions. Mm -hmm. So depending on somebody's experience, somebody might say, hey, yes, I can do it this way and solve it. Another person can do it another way and solve it and save you some money mm -hmm. but both solutions are good solutions yeah you know and it's common sense to to, to figure out if it's a good solution right. right of course i mean if a guy just like lay some, some bricks some down wood. and <laughs> lay <laughs> some wood on it yeah. nah that's <laughs> not gonna <laughs> work but if, i mean if he has a legitimate solution and it yeah. makes sense right and he can save you some money then it could that that could be your solution so okay. getting getting extra quotes is not always a bad idea because moving forward what that does is that Next, the next project you already have like when you find that issue mm -hmm. you already got a solution for that problem because mm -hmm. you've already faced it got before. you that's smart so you just add on the knowledge yep. to every deal exactly okay i got you um now me i'm big on you know staying organized so i want to try to create a systematic process on my first flip so i can take mm -hmm. that to the next one how do you best you know keep on track and stay organized with your budgets you know, timeline, like, are you using a certain type of CRM or some system? Like, how do you, you stay organized with that stuff? I do use a CRM and it's called Monday and I will leave a link for Monday um, in here uh, and, and how my Monday app looks. Starting out, if you're just doing one or two, mm -hmm. I mean, you can use a CRM to kind of get used to it, to scale up. Yep. But uh, I didn't have a CRM starting out. Okay. Um, I've, I've used a lot of spreadsheets and over the years I've tried some different stuff. Just recently, last seven or eight months, I've been on Monday. Mm. But um, it all starts back with you having a good scope of work. Okay. Because when you do the scope of work, you want to spell out everything you want to do. And then you want to create a timeline in that scope of work. Okay. Because like if you're hiring a contractor, then you want to talk to the contractor about a realistic time frame. Mm. If you're hiring all your subs, then you want to talk to your subs about a realistic time frame and organize them up front. Okay. And it's really not that many pieces to the pie. Like, mm -hmm. if you're doing a, a, a just say a, a cosmetic job, you probably got demo, yep. and then you got maybe some light framing. Um, then you probably gonna do your mechanicals. I mean, if it's like rehab, they're probably just fixing what you demo yep. in that area. So it's okay. like maybe some electrical and plumbing. Um, maybe the HVAC, so all your mechanicals could be done one week, and then it's sheetrock. Then you got you know cabinets, trim, and that that type of stuff. So it's okay. not it's not you know super complicated to have a schedule, but the, but you want to talk to your subs yep. if you're individually managing them mm -hmm. to set that expectation yeah, up front. Yeah, okay. set that expectation up front and get a time frame for them. Hey, I'm gonna be ready to start in a couple weeks. You know, um, I'm going to need you. You know, how long is it going to take you to the job? Mm -hmm. they, they tell you a week or two days, then you, you know, you organize it up front. Okay. I got and then, you. and then before, before you get to the point where you need them, you want to make sure they're on, on board still. Because this business is always about pre-planning and then being proactive and then managing your subs or managing your GC. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm not waiting till, you know, tomorrow to say, you know, hey man, I'm gonna need you on Saturday. When right. Tomorrow Saturday. Yeah. I'm gonna sure. need you. Well, I'm not calling Friday and say I need you on Saturday. I'm like, 
four or five days out. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, you know, we got the project coming up, just a reminder, you know, we about five, six days out, you still on board to start. Mm -hmm. Because I, to because, and, and then you still good for three days. Yeah. Because on day four, I got such and such coming. So I'm gonna need you to stick mm -hmm. to that schedule. Gotcha. And so I'm always talking to the pieces to make sure it's that everybody's day. still, because if it's not, then I need to tell the person after him, it may be another day or two. Yeah, so you're yeah. always being proactive to make sure everybody is 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 in sync, man. Okay, okay. Now, once you get to the finish line, everything seems to be done. Do you recommend getting another home inspection, like to you know inspect the house? Or I know sometimes if I had a buyer that bought a new build, they'll just kind of walk around do a punch list and put blue tape on the walls. Do you just leave it at like a punch list type thing, or do you get a hold of inspection once the project is done? Well, depending on the type of project, you're going to do at least two to three home inspections. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a cosmetic job uh, up front, maybe maybe it's just two inspections okay. because you're doing the initial. Yep. And then if you got some electrical plumbing and stuff, the light stuff that you're doing, you want to do one at the end okay. just to make sure everything's tight and uh, they didn't miss anything, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's holding 10 percent back at least until you do the home inspection then you can pay them when they fix everything. Okay. If you're doing a major renovation where you're gutting the wall down to the studs, um, I recommend the third home inspection. Um, and you'll do a home inspection um, before they do the sheetrock and after all your mechanicals. Mm. Because the city will come in and they'll inspect your electrical plumbing, your HVAC, your framing, your insulation. Mm -hmm. But having a, a private home inspector come do it is better because you know, as much as I love the city and these workers, yeah. I mean, sometimes they're in and out of these houses in 10, 15 minutes, where a home inspector's gonna spend an hour, two hours on the house, and he's gonna check everything and be more thorough than a city person yeah, you know, right. is gonna do. That and that sense. just helps you because they may find, I mean, I've had home inspectors just find simple stuff. Mm -hmm. And these are licensed plumbers where, you know, it might've just been something loose which if they, you know, if I didn't have the, the, the home inspector catch it, we could have put sheetrock on and it could have been a small water leak. Mm. You know, and then we would have to cut the sheetrock and fix it, but okay. it, it'll still been something we had to address. So, I mean, that can kind of, you know, save you um, money on the back end. Yeah. And then also it helps reinforce quality. That's key. Because now, now your people are like, Okay, Gene's gonna have inspection. a inspection. I, I gotta do it right. And he not paying me until, <laughs> until I get a good Yeah, order. I know I'm not getting that check until <laughs> until I see that inspection report. Yeah, and sure. and that and, and and I tell guys up front, man, like I, I do inspections on my stuff. And if it's not right, like I'm not paying you until yeah. it's right. Yeah. So if if you know, if you can't do the job to a, a certain standard and to code, don't don't look for me and ask me for <laughs> no <a> check. <laughs> If it's not it. right, it's just just business. Not, yeah, business. So I'm telling you this before you before you touch the house. So yeah. I don't want no issues when you, you're looking at me crazy <laughs> when when I don't write you that check because you have. I mean, it's your product. You have to care about what yeah, you're doing, 100%. and it's your money. And like you know, people can you know sue you or whatever. You can lose my. So you have to protect what you got, and yeah. you do it by doing using some of those home inspections. Hundred percent, y'all. He's not lying at all. I've seen him in action. Like he definitely makes sure he keep the business and the contractors know what to do. So that's key. Um, now, okay, one other thing again towards the towards the end of it. How important is staging the properties? Um, do you only stage it if it's in town, or let's say I'm out in like Riverdale on the outskirts? Would you stage those properties too? I do. Right now, I stage all my properties. Um, in the past, starting out, I didn't stage a lot of my properties. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I was just being cheap. I'm okay. like, man, staging 2500 2000 yeah. I don't know if I could do it. But staging is actually a part of my budget. Okay. And it's a part of my process. Because, like, this house is nice. But if you take the furniture out, it looks totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing about staging, it brings the property to life and people take ownership of the spaces, you know, especially if you got a house where, you know, it's, it's small or you got some awkwardness going on to it. A nice staging job can kind of help, yeah, you know, fill in the gap so people like, OK, that, you know, I can yeah, work with that. A lot of buyers, they can't really imagine what it looks like with furniture in it. Mm -hmm. So you're really helping them up front. Yeah, so it does. And a lot of people. And, and, and the key is. 
having a good stager. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know like the I mean, because I've had stagers in the past where, you know, online, like, the picture looked like, you know, they stayed in the yeah, bucket right. house. <laughs> right. But then when you get there, it's like, they just man, they got there. this furniture from their grandma house. Like, this old, <laughs> yeah. you know, chest from <laughs> 1964 wood. Yeah, that's crazy. Man, so, you you know, having a good stager is key. So you want to verify everybody almost that you're using in the process. Yeah. Like in the state, and like a lot of it's referrals. Yeah, referrals. Like referrals. the stager, like a lot of people I got now, um, it's just been, been referrals. Okay. Yeah, okay. like the stager I have now, she's great. Um, I'll leave a link for her. She's done a lot of my houses the last two years, and she was a referral from another investor. Mm, okay. And she was so better than my better than my last stager and a little bit less money. So, That's um, I mean, business is business. I like who I work with, but if somebody can bring more to the table, yeah, more value, and do a better job, then I'm gonna have to make a business decision to go with the person that that I think can help me more. Yeah. You know. Hundred percent, man. So it's all about networking, it mm -hmm. seems like. Um, I think my last question for you is, you know, for somebody new that's hopping into it, you know, you might have somebody who's conservative, who's not used to take, you know, taking risks, because flipping a house is taking a risk. It is. Um, what what mindset or what steps can they take to kind of take that fear away if they have any fear? Or what mindset should somebody have just jumping into flipping houses? Well, one is, you know, the, the thing people fear are like the unknowns. Yep. Um, and it just uh, and some stuff just not gonna come until you start doing it. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll say, study your comps, study your market, and know your numbers. So you really got to know like what values are in that neighborhood, um, and you really have to know what it what it takes to renovate a property. And it starts with doing home inspections and having detailed scopes of work and being able to have your numbers right out the gate. Mm -hmm. Because if you buy a house and you think it needs 50, but it needs 75, then that extra 25 could have been the profit that make or break you. Yeah. So it's knowing it's knowing all those numbers out the gate, man. Okay. And that just comes with, with studying, time, and everything else. It's just like, you know, if you're a basketball player um, and, you know, you're trying to, you know, improve your game, you're mm -hmm. in the gym shooting a thousand jump shots a day, you yeah. know. So Easy. if you're an investor, why wouldn't you be looking at, you know, hundreds of properties a week, whether online or just driving by and learning the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Like the more you see, the better you're going to get, mm -hmm. you know? So just start, like if you're looking at that area, start looking at every house. Like I want to know every house that comes up in a neighborhood. Like I want to know every house that, every everything. Yeah. And so it's just studying those areas and just driving those areas and just knowing what's going on and looking at comps. You want to be to the point where if somebody said, man, I got a house in Decatur, four sided brick, 300, 32 for 100 grand. You're like, you ain't got to think you about it. it. Man, that's the deal. <laughs> you know like, I don't even got to see the house. Like, you send know me the contract, you. I want it. Yep, you so know. like that's key. that part. So studying, learning, educating yourself, you know, putting the work in, you know, that's what it, that's what it boils down to. The more work you put in, the more at ease and comfortable you're going to feel about it. Yeah, and I can vouch y'all. Um, Cause me myself, I probably lost deal just cause I didn't know the market as good as Gene. Cause he really does buy property sight unseen. So speed to the deal is everything. Like if you can know your numbers off real, you might get the deal by being the first one to get an offer in. So what he's saying is 100% true. Um, I guess lastly, is there, I feel like I covered everything. I'm trying to help y'all out. Is there any last tips that you can give to somebody who's, you know, new getting in to invest in their flipping house? Yeah, it, it just probably just goes back to the last thing I said, you know, the, you know, the biggest thing you can bring and learn is just understanding the market. Okay. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of hustle yep. and you can, and, and you can make it and you can make a lot of money flipping houses, but just start doing it and start learning, like learn values, learn comps, um, learn how to run comps properly, start looking at neighborhoods. Start understanding everything. Um, and then, you know, like you put the work in, it'll come out of it. Okay. Cause there's so so much, so many little nuances to running comps. Like, yeah. you know, when you get on the outskirts, every every area is different. You go on the outskirts, you can have two houses built in 2000. You just say both of them was built in the year 2000. Both of them 3000 square feet. Both of them are four sided brick. Yep. One house could be 350. The other house could be 300. And, 
the other things gonna determine the value of the house, and that might just be the amenities. Yeah, that's it. One house might have, <laughs> you know, a, a you know gated community and pool, where the other ones don't have that. Yep. So when you're looking at comps, you want to make sure one, you're comparing apples to apples, but when you're in certain subdivisions, you want to make sure you're comparing amenities mm -hmm. to amenities. So you know, and it's just looking at a lot of properties and understanding those areas. So that's key. It's, it's if you want it, it's out there, it's yep. available, but just grind. You know, start reading, you know, books when you're driving around, you know, start listening to podcasts, mm -hmm. you know, start listening to, you know, channels like this. We're going to be doing a lot of content like this. Listen to other people who are successful and, and who's, who's done it. Uh, for me, as an agent, I've sold over 2,000 houses as an agent. Uh, I've lost track of how many flips I've done. I mean, five, six hundred flips, a bunch of new bills, a bunch of additions, um, Second story additions, additions off the side, additions off the rear, developing land, and all that stuff didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It started with me. It started with me taking the chance, you know, opening my mouth and asking an investor, you know, hey, hey, you know, I can find a property if you can give me a piece of the profit. That's where it all started. You know? <laughs> and I'll take it back. I'll take That's it back crazy. from there. It started with me just being the agent. Mm -hmm. I was the agent finding properties for investors. Wow. Okay. And so I got to the point where I'm finding these properties, but they making a lot of money, which which I'm I'm business yeah. sense too. Yeah. Like I, I wanna I wanna make some money. Yeah. I wanna make some money. So if I'm doing all the work and I'm finding a property for fifty thousand, they put twenty in it and sell it and make forty or fifty. And I'm doing all the all work. The all work. you're doing is putting the <laughs> money in. Money in yeah. So it's like, I know how to do it. Yep. I just don't have the money to do it. Yep. So I went to my investors and say, listen, I'm finding properties at, you know, because prices were cheap back then. So getting 3%, you know, 3,000, you're yeah. making 50,000. Right. So I had the conversation and said, listen, I'll find the properties, but I want 25%. You know, I didn't ask for 50 out the gate. Yeah, it was 25. Right. They agreed to it, and then I met other investors. But the next set of investors, listen, it's 50 50. Because now I had the confidence, I knew I knew what I was doing, <laughs> right, I knew so. I knew my stuff. And then it went from 75 25. <laughs> you get 25, <laughs> I get 75. That's crazy. Because by then I was doing my own deals, yeah. but I didn't want to be doing everything by myself. Yeah, I right. still, I might do two or three by myself. Then I got one or two people I'm doing the 25, 75, the old model. Then I got my 50-50. Then I got my new people I'm doing 75-25. <laughs> and then it went from that to, listen, I don't even partner with nobody. <laughs> right. Y'all could be my lender. Right, right. I pay you 8% or 10% and I, you know, right. you know, you, you know, I'm good for it. That's so crazy. that's how I flipped the script, man. Okay. But cool. it, it, but it all started with learning the area. Mm -hmm. Like when I was driving around, man, I was always trying to listen to something about real estate, you know? And then I got the Audible like books. I was listening to the Audible books. And um, even if it wasn't about real estate, I was listening to stuff about mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I always want to put positive stuff in my mind. Yeah, that's key, man. Because, because if you believe you can do it, you can. If you believe you can't do it, you can't. Mm -hmm. Either way, you're right. And it's just funny how just believing in yourself and knowing that it's gonna happen, like when you know, know when you know something gonna happen, like it kind of does happen if you yeah, put the man. work in to make it happen. I've seen you do it too. So it's that's crazy. just what it boils I'm down on to. I've seen that myself, but I've seen you do it a lot of times, so I believe that for sure. That's crazy. But I think, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, I think you answered everything yeah. for me, man. I truly well, appreciate cool, that cool, for sure. Cool. Well, guys, we appreciate you guys joining us. We hope you learned some stuff that you can apply in your real business. Um, definitely invest in yourself. Don't be afraid to spend money on a course. I've spent money on a lot of good courses. I waste money on a lot of bad courses. You know, I've, I've done a lot of audio books um, because I, I rather listen to them than to read. But uh, just educate yourself. If you want to do something, you know, you can do it. But it starts with educating yourself, believing in yourself, and taking it seriously, and just having a passion for what you're doing. If you do all those things, you are on the right track to be successful. Please guys, hit that like button below and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, this is Gino J. 
my guest, Brendan, and we'll see you guys next time. Right, Peace. Yeah.